Welcome. And greetings in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us this morning, whether you're here in person or you're viewing us online. We're glad that uh, you've chosen to be part of uh, our service uh, this morning. We, uh, we, gather, we gather for worship. We gather to hear from God and for him to speak to us through his word and by his spirit. And our desire is that he would be exalted through all that we do this morning. And the scriptures declare this. It says this about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. And I invite you to join in a response, and your response is in the uh, uh, bold type. He is the head. He is the foundation. He is the vine. He is the bridegroom. He is the shepherd. He is the way. May our worship rise from hearts that are fully devoted to Jesus. May you join the worship team as we worship together.
gladly forever adore him. One way we show adoration is through our lives. How do we do that? By living according to our design as beloved children of God. By embracing, pressing into, and enjoying all the blessings God has lovingly, freely, abundantly, graciously given us. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out onto us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered us his kindness on us along with wisdom and understanding. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, and I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes So bless the
10,000 reasons to give thanks is what we are sorry <laughs> among the 10,000 reasons to give thanks is that we are included in Christ and it was all his doing for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have come to fullness in him who is the head of every ruler and authority and when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. Sing hallelujah 
You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. For those children who signed up uh, for Children's Church, now is the time where you can uh, follow Jennifer and Dean in the uh, fireside room. I invite you to join me in prayer. O oh, gracious and loving Father, we thank you that you have made a way for us to come to you through the death and resurrection of Christ, for the gift of forgiveness, for the grace of reconciliation, and the generous outpouring of your Holy Spirit into our lives. Help us to live out the two great commandments that you gave, to love you with all our heart and soul body, mind, and strength, and to love one another as we love ourselves. Help us in our weakness, in our human frailties, when we act out of selfishness and not out of love. Strengthen us with resolve to follow you as our leader. Increase our desire for you, and forgive us for the coldness and the hardness that still lodge within our hearts. Dear God, through the power of the Spirit and the encouragement of one another. Help us to be the body of Christ to one another, that we would acknowledge that Christ, both in word and in deed, that we do that in our lives and with everyone in whom we encounter. May we humbly uh, be people that, uh, that follow you in, in, with deeper desires and longings. Father, that we can in that loving of you and loving of one another, we can accept one another. We can strive for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And Lord, we know that these are big requests, and we acknowledge our utter dependence on you to answer these prayers. And so, Father, we bring to you, as one who loves us, the things that weigh on our hearts and our minds this day, for the struggles that we face in our own lives, and the pain that we see in those that we know and we love. We ask that you would comfort, that you would provide, that you would heal, that you would protect, that you would encourage according to what each of us needs and those that we're praying for. Because we entrust all who are near and dear to you, to your never-loving love and your kindness for this life and the life to come. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, who is Jesus? And why does it matter? Who is Jesus? And why does it matter? The answer to that first question, who is Jesus, is linked to our experiences. And for those people that have not have a encountered the Scriptures, or are familiar with the Scriptures, those experiences are things that they've learned or experienced or absorbed in all manner of ways. For instance, sometimes it's just through the flippant language that we hear people say about, he's the big guy upstairs, or he's the guy with the big stick. Or the ways that we choose to interpret events in our lives or in the world in attributing that God caused it, whether it's a tsunami or a flood or a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake or whatever it is, uh, and how we can associate that or call, say that God has caused that in some way, which again creates images of God is, one who should be feared, one who is out to get us, one who, if we don't toe the line, is going to um, bring disaster to us. Another way that we do it is or people have done it, is just through the media. I'm not, I haven't watched the movie, but uh, one movie that uh, depicts God in a certain way is a movie called um, Bruce Almighty. It uh, earned almost $483 million in profits, so people did watch it. It's my understanding that it's a movie about a guy who is in the uh, media business, a newscasting business. He's overlooked for some promotions, and he attributes that to God being against him. And God shows up and said, well, if you can run things better, 
I'll let you do it for a while. But it gives us an image. And of course, I guess in the movie, he uh, uses some of those powers in ways that aren't fully consistent with what a loving God would do or how he would be. The Last Temptation of Christ, a popular movie depicting the life of Jesus Christ and also the struggles that they depicted in the movie, that he was tempted in the forms of temptation, that he feared, that he doubted, he had reluctance, and he, he struggled with, with lust. The Da Vinci Code, it's a novel that explores an alternative religious history whose central point is that some ancient French kings of the 6th and 7th century were descended from a bloodline that involved uh, both Jesus and Mary Magdalene. These images impact our understanding of who Jesus is. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, who have some contact with the Scriptures, that enters into it as well. It's how we then translate or look at or interpret the Scriptures that creates these images and views of God. And if we use selected Scriptures, we can get a very broader divergent view of who God is from one who is mad and upset with us all the time and wants to get us. Unfortunately, Jesus comes to get in between that so that uh, God doesn't zap us all the time to all kinds of images that uh, come to be. And these are powerful. They impact the way that we view Jesus and our view of Jesus then impacts the way that we respond to him. There's a Barna research, and Barna is, is uh, well noted as a, as a researcher and a polar of people. And in some research, he says this, that 52% of millennials don't believe that Jesus was God. 35% say that Jesus was merely just a religious leader or a spiritual leader. 17% aren't even sure who he is or what he was. 52% of all people surveyed believe Jesus committed sins while he was on earth. And so these things that we absorb uh, through various ways and means do impact the way that we see Jesus. And so the question is, how do you understand Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? And why is our understanding important? Because of the implications that are there because if Jesus is really who he says he is, then there are implications for our lives, some things that we need to take seriously in regards to our relationship with him, our view of the world, our view of other people, our understanding and our view of ourselves. Barna also did some research that says this, among adults who have made a personal commitment to Jesus, most also, also believe that Jesus is the way to heaven. When given several beliefs about the afterlife to choose from, nearly two-thirds of those who have made a personal commitment to Jesus say they believe that after they die they'll go to heaven because they have confessed their sins and accepted Jesus. That's 63%. 5% say they're going to go to heaven because they obey the Ten Commandments. 8% say because they're a good person. And 5% say everybody's going to go to heaven. And so today, we're beginning a, a short series looking at who is Jesus and why does it matter. And our source for this is a first century sermon that uh, came to us. It was eventually written down, and we know it as the uh, book of Hebrews. And as a recorded sermon, it is of a different style and um, structure than the epistles, the letters, the letters that Paul wrote, the letters that Peter wrote, that John wrote, that James wrote. It's a sermon, and so it has a different style. And, each, and even sermons have different styles. And this one happens to be, if you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, is that the, the preacher begins the sermon and, um, introducing a topic, and then moves on to another topic. And then after a while, he he kind of spirals back to the first topic that he brought up and talks for it a bit and goes a little bit deeper in length and then keeps going on and then he'll circle back maybe a third time or a fourth time to that same topic. And so it's very difficult in some ways to um, outline or to systematically walk through the letter. One example is that 
one theme that's in the book of Hebrews is Jesus is the high priest. He introduces it in chapter 2, comes back to it in chapter 4, touches on it again in chapter um, 5, and then in chapter 7 through 10, develops it in greater length. And so, the way that I want to approach it is to look at some of these pictures of who Jesus is as they come up in the book of Hebrews. Now, the primary audience for the book, a clue is, just even the name of the book, Hebrews, is that these were Jewish converts to the faith. And an assumption that the, the preacher has with regard to this is that because they're Jewish in their background, they're familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And so as he brings up people and ideas and events and experiences, he assumes that people will understand it in the bigger context of the Old Testament that he's referring to. Now, there is a bit of a debate on when this book was written. Some think it was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Others believe it was written after, immediately after the destruction of the temple. But in either way, what's important here is that these were followers of Jesus, Jewish followers of the Messiah, who were living in a time of, um, of difficulty, a time of troubles. There was, they were experiencing discrimination, injustices, and even persecutions. And because of that, because of those things that they were experiencing over time, they were becoming discouraged and they were losing heart. And the tendency in those kinds of situations is to just to begin to question, who is Jesus? Is this really worth it following Him? And sometimes you just want to give up or to give in when you're constantly having to experience difficulties and tragedies and injustices in your life. Walter Elwell, in a, uh, his commentary, uh, evangelical commentary on the Bible, says this regarding uh, Hebrews. He says, The author's purpose in writing is clear, is clear, for he reiterates it regularly. He writes to arrest an emerging apostasy and to strengthen wearying faith. Perhaps some members of this community had already deserted the faith, turning their backs on the way of salvation and the Savior that they had once acknowledged. And so we see in the book um, descriptions of uh, situations and warnings that are there. For some in the book, he seems to be saying that some have already left the faith, that they've turned, they've become uh, apostate. Others are considering returning to Judaism because they find it more familiar to them and just a more comfortable way of being uh, for them. Others were finding it hard, and they were people who were, were kind of just losing sight of putting forth the effort. And he calls these people, or he describes these as those who are wandering from the faith. And then he also talks about people who are drifting. In our faith journeys, in our lives, there will likely be times when we fight, face similar situations where we are tempted to drift or to give in or to give up, to ask, is it really worth it because of some of the circumstances that seem to be uh, weighing heavily on us. And in some ways, the last 14 months have been that for many people with COVID, that becoming distressed, becoming anxious, becoming tired, becoming just weary of facing it and asking some questions of, is this worth it? What's, where is God in this? How is God part of, of this time? What the preacher does in the letter, in the, in the sermon, is that he points people to Jesus. And he points them there because he says that Jesus can and he actually desires to give us help and hope in troubled times. And he can do this because of who he is and what he has done. It opens, the sermon opens, the letter opens with these words. Long ago, God spoke to our, our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, 
through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. It begins with quite a description. And if we consider the magnitude and what, what the, the preacher is saying, it is, it's breathtaking in many ways. That we, at this time, he says, are being given direct communication by God through Jesus. And he talks about that in the past, he spoke through special messengers. He spoke through the prophets. He spoke through angels and visions uh, as well. But the thing is, in the past, in speaking through the prophets, it's like a, a jigsaw puzzle where a prophet got a little piece and he puts it down to start creating a picture. And another prophet gets a piece and lays it down and another prophet. And all of a sudden, these pieces are starting to form a picture, but you can't quite see the whole picture yet. But they're significant pieces of the picture. And now what he says is that Jesus has come along and he's the one now that fills in the whole picture. Now we can see exactly what it is. And so these fragments come together in Jesus who is the completion of or the fulfillment of all that the prophets were talking about. And he says that in these last days that this is going to happen. And what again, that, that there's these um, images from the Old Testament that, that the Jewish people would probably um, recall in, in various uh, prophets talking about the prophets saying, in the last days, the Messiah is going to come. In the last days, God's going to raise up. And so what he's saying is, these are now the last days. And so the last day is when God intervenes decisively in human history and brings to completion what he had talked about for nearly 2,000 years or more through the prophets. And what is this completion that has happened? It's that Jesus is now going to reconcile all things. That this mystery is that both Jews and Gentiles are united together in one body. And Jesus has fulfilled it in his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so then he begins to describe what's the, the significance of this. And he says that he has spoken through the Son. And again, the Son, that's significant in that the Son is an heir, an heir to all things. And so in other words, Jesus is saying that here's the person the preacher saying, here's the person that's the fulfillment of all that's gone before, and he is the son. He is going to inherit all things. And why? Because in him, through him, by him, for him, all things were created, and all things exist, and all things are going to hold together. And so he is at the top. There's nobody above him. And again, when we look at the, the, the passage, you'll see that he talks about angels and high priests and um, Moses and other things, and he's, he's clearly stating that Jesus is above all that because of what he, who he is and what he's done. In fact, he goes to the point of saying he's the exact imprint of God. The exact imprint of God. Colossians tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Eugene Peterson puts it this way with regard to that passage in, first, in, in Colossians 1. We look at this Son and we see God who cannot be seen. We look at this Son and we see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in Him and finds its purpose in Him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And so what is that saying? 
not only in, in Hebrews, we can see it in Colossians, there's a passage in Ephesians, in the beginning of the Gospel of John. And so we can say this, that God is like Jesus. God is like Jesus. And not only is He like Jesus, but He is the one who willingly sacrificed Himself so that we could be included in relationship with God, the Son, and the Spirit. And so these opening verses, he sets out the supremacy of Jesus in all things. And we will see it through numerous ways throughout the, um, without, throughout the sermon, that Christ is superior in everything and every way that's gone before. And again, he's, now he draws on the Old Testament. And he'll point out something in the Old Testament. And he'll show how Jesus has actually either fulfilled that or he's superior to that. He talks about angels. He says, you were impressed with the message of angels. And they were. Well, Jesus is the messenger. He's not. He's the one. He's the one that the messengers were talking about. He says, you, were, you praised and you exalted Moses. But he was simply a representative of God. And Jesus is actually the Son. You honored the priesthood because they were appointed by God to be intermediaries, go-betweens. Well, Jesus is the high priest because He intercedes directly with God. You benefited from offering sacrifices for sin. Well, that doesn't hold a candle to what Jesus has done because He is a once-for-all sacrifice of Himself for all sin, for all humanity. And so why is knowing Jesus important? Who Jesus is? Because to know Jesus is to know what God is like. And there's no difference between Jesus and God. Knowing Jesus provides us with a true understanding of God. And in doing that helps us to go into greater depth of, of richness, of relationship with God. This is the very thing He designed and desired for us. Jesus says in, in John, He says this, On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And that's the relationship that exists and the relationship that God wants through Jesus to develop and expand and grow in us. God has spoken to us in Jesus, and He, be, and he continues to speak to us in Jesus. And He does this in a number of ways. Through the Scriptures, Jesus speaks to us. Through teaching, we hear about the Scriptures. Through worship, Jesus is speaking. Through the Spirit Himself, convicting, prompting us. Jesus speaks through others. Jesus speaks through creation. And so Jesus is constantly speaking through various ways and various means. And what He's asking for us is to stay awake, to pay attention, to listen. Because God's words have power. They're alive, Hebrews tells us, active. And no one can encounter Jesus and remain the same. And so, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus in your mind? What pictures come to mind? How, what does He look like for you? It's important. Because that will determine and help us to, to live in certain ways or not. I remember, and it was August of uh, 2018, we were driving to Ontario. And uh, we were listening to a, a book on tape. And it was amazing that Jan went to the library. And it's not amazing that she went to the library. It's amazing that she found this book on, on tape that we listened to. And the title was called The Shack Revisited. And if you're familiar with the book that um, uh, Paul Young wrote, The Shack, it's, it's sold, I think it's close to 25 million copies now um, that's been sold. But this book, and I didn't have any recollection of what it was about, but what it is is a theologian by the name of Baxter Kruger uh, was contacted actually by Paul Young through a, 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 
a second person. And he said to Baxter, he says, you have a theology of the Trinity that matches up with, with my book, and I'd like to investigate that. And so he wrote the book, The Shack Revisited. We listened to it on the way to Ontario, and it was, it's one of those books that, that changes the direction in your thinking and even in your life. And it was so good that we listened to it again on the way back. And then I bought the book, and we read it again and read it again. And it's made a difference because it's answering the question, it, for me, more clearly, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? He's just like God, and God is like Jesus. And that put Jesus or God in a very different perspective in my life because for many years, I saw God as being, in a sense, separate from Jesus, who is there with the big stick, who is out to look at uh, somebody doing something wrong and wanting just to clobber him. And, uh, and that Jesus somehow, by accepting him, gets in between me and God to kind of keep God at, at bay, to keep him calmed down. But that's not the case at all. That God's very nature, in essence, is love. And so all that God does, all, the, all his other characteristics are expressions of love. So God's anger is an anger that's in the circle of love. His wrath is in the circle of love. His judgment, his mercy, his grace, his kindness. And all of a sudden, my understanding of God begins to change. It's because of my understanding of who Jesus is and who God is. And now I see God within the circle of this trinity of, of self-giving, other-centered love of one another, and I'm invited into the center of that relationship, a relationship of love, not a relationship of being out to get me or against me or not wanting me or saying, okay, I guess i got to let you in because you prayed to receive Jesus but to be desired to be in that relationship. And so who is Jesus? It matters who he is. And so the book of Hebrews is going to help us to unpack who Jesus is through these images of high priest, of better than angels, of more sufficient or superior than Moses, and on and on it goes. And the reason for it, for the writer, is that he wants these people, these Hebrew followers of Jesus, who are living in troubled times to find help and hope in their situation. And so one of the things that we can do as we begin to look at this book is to take some time and simply ask God by the Spirit to say, is there anything in me that is a false belief or a false understanding of who you are? and allow the Spirit to bring something to mind. Oftentimes, those beliefs are connected to an experience or to an event or to some word that was spoken to us at some time. And so, we invite Jesus to come into that situation, to that time, and we offer it to Him. And we receive in, repla in, in place of that a healing from Him so that our mind and our understanding can be more in sync with the reality and the truth of who He is and His desires for us. And so we, I invite you to, uh, to read through the book. And again, we'll hit it on different um, topics. And so we'll be uh, looking at different passages throughout the Scriptures. Uh, but I believe it will help us to find hope and to find help for the troubled times that we're living in. Because that's what His desire is for us. So that we can persevere. So that we can walk by faith. So that we can enjoy the richness of what it is to be a child of God. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank You. 
for your word. I thank you that you speak and you're speaking right now and then you continue to speak. And I pray that you would just give us ears to hear and hearts to receive all the things that uh, you want to communicate to us. And I pray, Father, for those of us who might uh, struggle with misformed or misshapen understandings of who you are, that you would help just to reveal those things and replace it with the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Of the goodness of God, I 
will sing of the goodness of God. We got one announcement that Jennifer wants to make before we uh, give the benediction. Good morning. Um, because of our limited in-house numbers, we're trying to do a few different things with uh, junior church. So if you have kids that are junior church age and you're picking a specific service because, hey, we're having children's ministry that day, let me know because we're, I'm willing to move it around or, or things like that depending on what service people want to go to. Also, um, starting Friday, May 7th, which is next well, Friday coming up, um, we are having youth group for grades 5 to 8 on Fridays, and grades 9 to 12 will stay on Tuesdays. That's what you guys are on, right, Tuesdays? <laughs> so we're going to start a junior high youth group for, well, a junior youth group for grades 5 to 8. So they are going to be doing a 12-week series called Bible Unearthed, and it's uh, it's a what's the word, archaeology-based thing. We're uh, proving the Bible through archaeology and stuff, so I think they're going to have a lot of fun uh, with that and whatever. And that for this week, that will be from 7 till 9. Some, we're trying to figure out the times and whatever for that based on volunteer availability and stuff. If you are willing to volunteer for junior youth, even on a rotational basis of once a month or something, please let me know. Um, and same thing with uh, children's ministries. Thank you very much. And now may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and have a great week. Amen.